recording in progress. Okay, so uh, good morning, folks. We're going to be uh, dealing with a somewhat impaired audio situation at the moment because uh, during our last time together, um, there seemed to be problems with my um, <laughs> more serious microphone that I normally use, uh, this uh, Dalek looking uh, contraption. And uh, I need to debug it and figure out what's going on. I don't want to risk uh, losing audio in the midst of the stream. So uh, we'll, we'll bear with the built-in audio, uh, recognizing that probably on average, it's lower quality uh, than the other, but at least it won't conk out. At least that's the uh, hope. Um, OK, so today, um, I wanted to continue to press on some experience with system dynamics. I haven't forgotten my promise to uh, come back to you with uh, a, uh, a sort of thoughtfully composed causal loop diagram. I was thinking of doing that at the beginning of class today, but we really have a tight schedule to get through other materials. So I'm gonna, gonna need to leave that as something I'll ask you to look at separately, and then we'll we'll comment on it briefly in another uh, another class. But but today I want to get on to uh, uh, some elements of system dynamic structure and behavior. And to that end, I asked people here to review a few videos, um, and uh, those videos uh, were two for today. Uh, and and then there's some subsequent ones uh, for next week that I provided to you early in hopes that it might allow you to get started on. Um, and if you did get started on those later videos, it will it'll probably help for understanding some of what you see uh, today and uh, may help connect some concepts. Uh, if you didn't, no worries, but... Um, Reflecting back on today's session may be valuable when you do watch those videos. Okay, so uh, I asked you to watch two videos for today. Now, one of them dealt with some basics intuition associated with numerical integration of dynamic variables with a particular example of, of a system of, of uh, ODEs, of ordinary differential equations, uh, with uh, the motivating example being a first order delay. But the other one talked uh, in more depth about first order delays. Can anyone comment? Um, when, when I mentioned the term first order delay, and I've mentioned it probably a good 10 times here in the course, um, can anyone give me a sense? What do I mean by a first order delay? What is a, What distinguishes a first order delay as such. What is it? What is it kind of distinguishing feature here that marks it out as a first order delay? Anyone? There were several varieties shown to you in the video. One is target follower, one investigating uh, the relationship between the, the inflow and the outflow and how. And seeking a state of balance where the outflow equals the inflow. Uh, and I think I introduced variance in them with oscillations as well in those videos. But the first order delays there were shown, they, uh, the variety of them were shown, but they all shared one property. And what was that property? Anyone? So in a first order delay, we think about it as a unit. How many stocks does it have? Count of stocks? Does it have any stocks? Oh, well, I'm glad I didn't give a pop quiz today. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, Matthias. Just the greater. We had two videos. Two videos. One was on numerical integration, that's right. And and one was there were two short videos for today for the 60. I was just checking when you video It's it's in the announcements on on yes, uh, Tim. It was hard to it was easy to miss because one of them popped up. 
up with a preview of the video and so if you just kind of oh oh okay maybe that is why thank you thank you um okay well um i'll I'll introduce first order delays a little bit more than today. I mean, a, a first order delay has a single stock and it typically has one or more inflows, but what really distinguishes this a first order delay is that it has an outflow, typically one outflow, whose value depends linearly <laughs> on the value of the stock. So if the stock is called X, this outflow, is some linear function of x, meaning it's x times a constant. It's not even an affine function. It's not even you know a constant plus another constant times x. It's always a constant times x. So it might be alpha x, for example, where alpha is a hazard rate. It's a chance per unit time of leaving. Right? It's a probability density, just like we encountered with state charts in agent-based modeling, where you had a chance per unit time of leaving, there was some small chance even in a, in a millisecond that you'd leave. The finer grain time you looked at, the finer the chance was, but went down linearly with that, but, but we have a chance of leaving. It's the same construct here. It's not a probability, it's a probability density, temporal probability density, a chance per unit time to leave. So this might be, for example, 0 0.01 times X, right? X again, it's the value of the stock. So this might be a thousand people who start here. And there's a 1% chance per day. <laughs> so a probability per day, right? Just like we have with the state charts of leaving. So on the first day, approximately 10 people would leave, right? A thousand times 0.01. A thousand divided by a hundred, right? Um, which would be 10 people on the first day. And if you play this out, what you'll see is that the number of people in the stock over time will change how? How will it change? This is, again, the, the number of people leaving per day. The flow out depends linearly on the stock. It's just some constant times the number of the stock. So what will that lead to in terms of dynamics here? Anyone? I see Mattias tracing out a, a curve in space. What sort of curve is it? It's an exponential. We've seen this before on this very board. And what's the, so, so if, if you started with the number of people in X at time zero, call it X of zero, the number of people in there at time T would go down as what? E to the minus, Alpha times T. This is our old friend, right? Okay, look, even if it's not your friend, at least it's your enemy. Like you should recognize this, right? <laughs> right? I hope you recognize that before. Whether it's your friend or enemy is your business, not mine. But um, but uh, this should be familiar because it's the same mathematics governing the probability of staying in what? that an agent stays in a state when you have a rate transition out, rate transition alpha, right? So that was one of the phases of stock of, of uh, first order delays. All first order delays share this property. The outflow is a linear function of the input. Now, another face of it, another kind of perspective to view it from would actually not be to view it as a constant times as this constant times x, but to view it instead as instead of x times instead of x times some alpha here, you could view it as having a, a mean time to leave tau. And so the formula for this before was alpha x. Now it's x what? This is a mean time to leave X. So Tom Charney, let me let me make it clear. Before when we had alpha here, just like this, the formula for this is alpha X. Right? I, I written up there, but, but that's the formula. It's the number of people per unit time you're leaving the stock, for example. Right? A thousand people at, at, at the initial time, 
0.01 chance for each of them, 10 people per day leaving, 0.01 chance per day, right? This is a unit one over time. This one here is 0.01. This is unit, say, people, <coughs> for example. And so the number of people per day that are leaving is X times this. It'll be people per unit time. That's what flows need. If there's a flow out of a stock that is dimension A, the flow will have dimension A over time. Flows in will have dimension A over time, flows out will have dimension A over time. So this is one form of, of first order delay. That's what we just talked about, right? And the number of people here will go down as this. Another form of first order delay is this is tau mean time. So now this is a mean time to leave. Mean time to leave. And what's the formula now? Divided by tau. And you can convert alpha into tau by, guess what? Alpha equals one over tau. So whether you phrase it as alpha times X or you phrase it as X times one over tau, in other words, X over tau, those are two different ways of saying the same thing. They're two synonyms. They're mathematically identical. But sometimes we prefer to talk, prefer to think about it. It's convenient to think about it as a mean time until you leave. At other times, it's convenient to think about it as a rate per day, a rate per unit time of leaving. Hmm? They're, they're just two sides of the same concept. And the mean is one over the rate, and the rate is one over the mean. So you could pick your way of describing it. Hmm? These are two different phrasings of our first order delay, okay? At its most basic level. Now, I do want you to watch that video because there's kind of two others, which are just these two shown with another broad phrasing <laughs> where we think of this as a target follower. Here we're, well, I'll ask you, with this phrasing of first order delay here, this here phrasing right on the board there. This, if we have a flow in, call it lowercase i, people per day, say. Let's suppose the flow in is 100 people per day. And let's suppose that we have 1,000 people on the stock initially. So let's suppose alpha is 0.01 or, or equally tau is 100. Those are equivalent statements. Um, then 10 people per day will be leaving, right? It'll be 1,000 divided by, by, uh, by 100, right? So if we have, if alpha equals 0.01, in other words, i.e. equivalently, tau equals what? And alpha 0.01 implies a tau of what? 100, 1 over 0.01. If that's the case, we start with a thousand people here. The number, the people per unit time leaving, people per day say leaving is, is going to be a thousand divided by a hundred, right? Or 10 people per day, or a thousand times 0.01, 10 people per day, right? It's the same thing. I hope you see this. Okay. So if we have that situation, and suppose we have 100 people coming in per day, is the value of the stock going to rise or fall or stay the same? If 100 people per day is coming in and 10 are leaving per day, is the value of the stock going to rise or fall? Yes, there's a, yes. Is that? Yes. It'll rise into 10,000. 10, uh, good. And why 10,000? You got it, Ben. So this, this rendition, it's easy to think about what with this framing of a first order delay wants is for the inflow to equal the outflow. When I say it wants it, it yearns for it. It's because that's when it will be in balance. That's when the value of the stock will no longer be going up, it will no longer be going down. It will be staying the same. 
it's at a happy state. It doesn't change, right? Inflow equals outflow. If inflow is greater than outflow, what will happen? It will decrease. If the inflow is greater than the outflow, it will increase, right? If, if the water is coming in your bathtub faster than it's leaving, the bathtub is going to go up. If the outflow is greater than the inflow, what's going to happen to the value of the stock? It will decrease over time. <laughs> and in this framing of the first order delay, if we have a fixed inflow and the outflow depends linearly on the value of the stock, if we have a fixed inflow and we run it forward, if the inflow is less than the initial outflow, Stock could be going down. If it's greater than the initial outflow, stock could be going up until the point where outflow equals inflow. Do people get that point? The stock yearns, to, it, it tries to the point. If, if the outflow is less than the inflow, it will rise until they are equal. Yeah? If the inflow is less than the outflow, it will fall until they are equal. You get that? Okay. Is it part of a feedback system? What sort of feedback is exhibited by this? Positive or negative? Negative feedback. Or if I phrased it as balancing or reinforcing, which would it be? Balancing. It wants balance. It is seeking for a situation where it's finding uh, a balance here. It, it moves in a direction to achieve that balance. If I suddenly adjusted I, if I suddenly were to adjust the inflow, like double it, the value of the outflow, well, so the value of the stock will start to rise and then in response or higher than it would have otherwise been. And, and the outflow will therefore start to go up until the outflow equals the inflow, right? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this is one phrase. Here, the outflow wants to follow the inflow. In the video, you'll learn another phrase, which is very important, which is very useful. And that stock uh, is a first order delay also, but where it's a, we say a target follower. If anyone watched that second video, what does this stock follow? It follows what? An exogenously imposed target so so we're going to set the outflow to be linearly dependent on the stock yes but it's it's going to be linearly dependent on the gap between the stock and a target so in other words the difference between the value of the stock and some target it'll be some target call it i'll call it target um minus the value of the stock and the value of the flow will be this divided by tau for example, or this times tau, okay? This is a gap. This is, okay, if the target is greater than X, then, and this is gonna be a flow into the stock, then it's gonna be like a flow in here. Instead of a flow out, it'll be one flow. These two are basically combined. That's one flow. If the target is greater than the stock, the flow in will be positive and the stock will go up. If the target is less than the stock, the, the, the flow in will be negative. So it'll be coming out and the stock will be going down until it follows the target. This is based on the value of the stock. This seeks the stock to be equal in value to the target. What we see here, Seek the outflow to be equal to the inflow. These are two different ways of framing first order delays that emphasize that they seek balance. Okay. And you could frame it in terms of seeking the stock equal to some value or the outflow seeking to be the same as the inflow. Please do watch that video. I can't cover all of it here because we have other things to talk about. But those are some intuitions. Now, Framing, uh, with that framing, I want to talk about some of the additional foundational understanding. So all this is covered in some slides I'll, I'll, I'll be posting, including 
the, the goal-seeking behavior associated with this, and the fact that we have this number of people here in the stock that decreases exponentially, and the flow rate that decreases exponentially. What if the flow rate also, I say the number of people in the stock decreases exponentially, what would the flow depend on but uh, decrease exponentially? There's a, a simple reason mathematically why the value of the flow, if the stock goes down over time exponentially or, or changes over time exponentially in this sort of way, um, that that the flow would also change exponentially. That's what you have to ask. That's true. Any kind of non okay yeah so that's one way of reasoning but but look if the stock is going is changing exponentially towards a new equilibrium could be going down until uh it's um until it reaches some equilibrium where the outflow will equal the inflow or it could be going up towards some equilibrium where the inflow equals the outflow but but if the stock is doing that, you're saying, look, the inflow is fixed. So the only thing that can be driving this is, is a similar change in outflow. That's true, but there's even, even a more pithy way to say it. Well, look, if the value of the stock is changing exponentially like this, the value of the flow is just what? How does the value of the flow depend on the value of the stock? Just the time, uh, stock times a constant or divided by a constant. I mean, Divided by constant is times constant, right? It's times one over the whatever you like. So, so if this is changing exponentially, this is also changing exponentially. Just that times a constant, just scale, right? Um, so, so ladies and gentlemen, um, here we have this uh, the outflow and the inflow both change in this sort of exponential way. Um, okay. So this is a linear system. This can be great important for what we're going to be talking about next week. And what we're even going to see a little bit today for lucky. So um, I say it's linear because here um, we have this right hand side depends only on constants and the term, which depends linearly on the, on the stock. So the rate of change depends linearly on this stock. And, and there's this offset term, but it turns out, and Stan would probably know by change of variables, by by choosing your different variables, you could make this term if you, if you use if you declare a, another variable that's p plus some constant, you can actually make this uh, disappear, reframe it in, in those terms. Um now I want to highlight these equations. They're going to be really important for us going forward, and I want to build up that intuition today. Okay, um, where these things came from. So, so these are differential equations. Okay? These are ordinary first order differential equations. So ODE. So sometimes I'm going to say ODE. Ordinary differential equations. That's in contrast to partial differential equations, which will often use to characterize, for example, spatial phenomena. Um, uh, here we have a single variable, uh, independent variable, we're interested in, in, in understanding. Um, and we have uh, time here as, as uh, the sort of unit of. Of, of interest. So we're, we're taking, looking at the change in this stock, say x, so p over time, p might be for perfect. Okay. This is the inflow and this is the outflow. And you'll notice how I'm writing. Um, so inflows are summed up on the right hand side, outflows are subtracted off on the right hand side. Okay. So for every outflow that comes out of p, there's a term that subtracts it off, and for every inflow that comes in, there's these terms that add it. Keep it on the and these are these two phrasings I just talked about, where we add p over tau, or where we add p 
times times alpha as we the first phrase that we have. Okay. So this is rendering this sort of first order delay into differential equations, into ordinary differential equations. Right now we only have one state variable. Okay. We're looking at it over time. So dot here means the derivative of p with respect to time. That's the rate of change of p, right? So p is persons, and we're talking about j as the unit of time. A p dot of five would mean <coughs> the number of people in p is rising by five people per day, right? We're getting p successfully day five more people in p. If p dot is minus five, what would it mean? What? Well, that's true, but if, if we just think about this, if p dot is minus five, what would it mean that p is doing over time? Decreasing if it's minus five, it's decreasing by five people per day. Um, if p is zero, if p dot is zero, p dot is zero, what would that mean that p is doing over time? The number of people. Uh, it, it's constant, right? It's not changing. If p dot is 10, it means it's rising by 10 people per day. If p dot is minus 10, it's falling by 10 people per day. Please make sure you understand this point. Okay. Because we're going to be working a lot with these and, and I'm going to be weaving them in increasingly. Now, these sort of first order delays are are everywhere. And I wanna I wanna build up actually a model using them that that includes them as building blocks. Um, <laughs> and you're going to be seeing a lot of these models to understand the mathematics of computing. Um, and I'm going to expect you to be able to quite fluidly translate from a model like this into its differential equation. We're mapping a syntax here, which is pretty straightforward, into a semantic domain, which is differential equation. Now, the grammar of these stock and flow models is uh, is something I'm not talking a lot about, but I, I do just want to talk about it a little. Okay? Um, so there's a grammar behind these stock and flow models. There's syntactic concepts. There's a syntax behind them. What is legal to hit to what? So for example, we have stocks and then we have the flows. And flows can either come from clouds, meaning outside the model, you don't pay attention to it, into a stock. They can leave from a stock into a cloud, or they can go from a stock to another stock. So this flow goes from this stock to this stock, the flow comes from the cloud into a stock, and a flow could go from a stock next to the flow. For example, if they were dead from infected, they would go from infected into a cloud. Cloud just means it's outside the cloud. Okay? That sort of rules from hits you got flows to stocks. Now, beyond that, we're going to have a couple other types of constructs. And there's param there are parameters, which are constant. Okay? And they don't have any arrows coming in. Stuff. They have no arrows that are incoming, but they can have arrows indicating dependency. So broadly, we have flows, which are one type of, of uh, connection here. And then we have these arrows, which are informational connections. Sometimes we think of flows as being what are called material flows, or material connections. Things flow down them. And then we think of the connections uh, or the links, as they're sometimes called, as being informational in character. And importantly, these links are instantaneous. Okay. So when we have a link, for example, from Evergreen to the Texas to, to this flow, it means this flow depends instantaneously on it. Somehow we were to magically change the duration of its exercise by being able to administer. A really powerful new drug that helps people recover faster that would change the number of people who are recovering for a unit time immediately. Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, and, and so these are, are instantaneous connections. 
population size, for example, here is shown as being an instantaneous sum of susceptible infected recovery. That construct is called a dynamic variable or more commonly auxiliary variable. Right? And you'll notice that it, it's the sum of this susceptible, infective, and recovered. It depends instantaneously on these, these values. So if susceptibles were to magically you know, become twice its previous value, it would be immediately reflected in population size. So there'll be a formula for population size, which in this case is just susceptible plus infected plus. plus. Similarly, the fractional prevalence, the fraction of the people that are infected depends instantaneously on susceptible, infected, and recovered. Uh, and maybe you can tell me. What would the formula be for fractional prevalence? Anyone? What's the formula? Yeah, divided by population. So we see fractional prevalence depends on population, which is just shorthand for susceptible, infected, and recovered, right? Uh, the sum of those. But, but fractional prevalence can be expressed as infected divided by population. So these indicate informational dependence, these, these connections. Okay. Um, and we build up these diagrams out of those pieces. These auxiliary variables can depend on constants, they can depend on stops, they can even depend on flows, they can depend on each other, like fractional prevalence depends on population size, so as long as there's no loop. Because you can't have A depending on B instantaneously and B depending on A. You can have a loop in the model as a whole, for example, effective to population size, to fractional prevalence, to incidence, to effective. There's a, there's a loop to it, but it's through a stock and flow. That's fine. The stocks capture the state of the system. So the system changes over time in a way that reflects the feedback. But you cannot have instantaneous things where you say, you know, A is twice B and B is three times A or something like that. You cannot have those sort of loops along dynamic variables. So I'm talking here about the kind of syntax, the grammar of these things, how you can arrange them, how they can be stuck together. Um, but the deeper thing, um, that I want you to know, also carry around. So, so that's significant. It turns out there's all mathematics for that that can be formalized and, and actually important insights can come. But I want to draw your attention now to the semantic, the most common semantics applied with this, which is differential equations. And um and I want you to to understand how to take, and I'm gonna put this in the back so I can move this thing here uh, to the appropriate place. Okay, now, now we're in trouble. Um, uh, but I wanna make sure that you can understand how to create the stocks, the, the, excuse me, the differential equations from this. Um, every year we uh, have some need for students to, to sort of turn this sort of stock and flow model into these equations. You'll be asked for that on assignments, and you'll be asked for this on the exam or pop quizzes. <laughs> you should be really comfortable. Let's unpack it. So if we have a model like this, uh, we might phrase it in terms of formulas here. You know, for example, immigration equals maybe some immigration rate of people per day. Um, recovery equals effective, would this be divided by your time? So recovery is the first sort of delay. If value at any given time will be therefore linearly kind of effective, don't either multiply that by constant or divide it by mathematically or the same mathematically it can be phrased as either one. So infective, is it going to be divided by average duration or multiplied by average duration? Divide. It has to be because we're flow out 
has the same units as it divided by time. So if this is average rate as a time, you have to divide by it to get a flow, a value, a legitimate value of flow, people per day. So the value of the flow here is going to be effective divided by average rate. And what we're going to see is when we transliterate this into the semantic domain, into the domain here, we're going to see it kind of here. So mu is the value of this forever. And so this flow here is I over mu. It's going to be flowing from I into R. So why is there a minus sign? I want to make sure people are solid. Why is there a minus sign? Because then it, it leaves it, yeah. It departs it. It's leaving from it, right? So if there were five people per day getting recovered, the rate of change of number of people who are infected at a given time, or they're you know, going up to people per day or, or down, you know, is it rising or falling? <laughs> You're going to be subtracting off. It. So suppose suppose no one was getting sick, all the other people recovered. Um, then if we had a thousand people sick and five people per day were were recovering, it would go the rate of change of I would be minus five. I dot would be minus five. So be, it's dropping by five people per day if they're recovering. Hmm? That's why there's a minus sign. Why is there a, implicitly a plus sign in front of, front of R? If there are five people per day recovering, that same flow flows into R. So suppose there's nobody who starts to, uh, nobody who starts recovering. And then there are five people per day that are coming in. The rate of change of the number of people that are recovered will be what? Five people per day, right? They're coming in. So the first day they'll go from zero to five. The second day will go from five to ten. The third day will go from ten to ten. Right? The flow. So you'll notice that these flows, if they flow from a stock to a stock, they appear in two places, right? They kind of are leaving the source stock and coming in with the same formula, but with a minus sign in front of it, right? That sure makes sense. Okay. This one is going down the, you know, the rate of increase of I, right? Um, and it's 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 flowing directly into R, so it's directly your determinant rate of change of R. Are people okay with that? Similarly, okay, gosh, I mean, this should actually be uh, shown. This is, the way this is shown is it's uh, so this should be this capital M here. Um, I trace it as a sub constant, some rate constant times the total population, which will be like the first or something like that. But really, what you say down to be most, uh, to be most clear. And I don't know if I can copy it down here to eliminate that that confusion. Um, anyway, um, you can just imagine this uh, omega m. It's, it's down. Yeah. Now this term here. It's going to be the real focus of a lot of our discussion. Uh, and this term reflects the unpacking of or the collapsing down of several layers of this region here. That'll be of great value in the kind of three and for understanding mathematics. Okay. Um, you'll notice that. This says there's no intermediate variables here. It doesn't say total population. It doesn't say fractional prevalence. Here, when we look at it, we prefer, kind of for software engineering reasons, to break out these intermediate values to the names, to the clear intentions behind them, communicate their meanings with good names. But when we express it mathematically, we collapse it all down. Let me tell you what each of these are. So we're going to call contact first accessible for day, C. We're going to call first contact risk of attraction, beta, okay? Um, and 
fractional prevalence, as Tony said, is going to be infective, but we'll call it I over susceptible plus infected plus recovered, which is what is this? This is the total population. I, so we could <laughs> call this I over our total population. Right? Um, and the total population, what is its formula going to be? Well, we just wrote it down there. I just erased it. What is it? S plus I plus O. Yeah. Right. The entire state of the population is summarized as infected, recovered, and infected, uh, infected, one recovered. Notice this note flow. I mean, the flows are just changing people from here to there. If you were to freeze this model at any one time, shut down your computer, there's only three numbers you have to write down to restart it. What are those three numbers? The number of people are susceptible and tagged in one That's all you have to write down. For an age based model, you have to write down a much bigger thing, right? If you stop that first age based model we work with, with that, with those waves of infection, you'd have to write down, in principle, the state of every agent within that model to restart it. Here, you just have to write down those three numbers. From that, you can calculate the flows, you can calculate the intermediate variables. And proceed. Okay, so we are going to routinely go back and forth between models like this, or for phrase for human consumption, and models like this, which are less software engineering focused, or more mathematically focused, and where we can apply mathematical tools to analyze. I want to hit one final moment before we dive into building up a little model of this sort, a model of this infectious disease sort, which will be very relevant to your time of prayer. So what I want to ask you is, we talked about when uh, a model like this is in balance. What is a model like this in balance if what equals what? Outflow equals in, inflow, right? Good now. If it flows straight into the outflow, the stock will be going up. If outflow is greater than the inflow, the stock will be going down. <laughs> if the two are equal, the stock will be safe, right? So we can balance from the two are the same. Good. So I want to graduate a little bit to a system like this. When will this system be in balance? Well, it will be in balance to be software balance, right? And that's a little bit hard to do because recovered is uh, as it only flows into it. But for each stock, what would have to be equal to what? The inflows would have to be equal to the outflows. So the sum of the inflows would have to be equal to the sum of the outflows. And I might show you here, for example, a, a stock where we have, or a, a, a system where we have, and I'm gonna uh, see if I can get this uh, quickly. I have a lot of these, um, uh, but where we might have, for example, a um, an open population with deaths in it. Um, and uh okay this is uh yes uh okay we're we're getting close to this oh come on um give me <laughs> okay um we're going places ladies and gentlemen okay here we have a an open population but it's not shown okay great um uh okay come on um show me a show me a model where where it's uh, really there we go okay good so how would the system be about? Um, which is a which is a traffic flow. Um, okay. Uh, oh come on. Um, I've, I've got to have a uh, a nice cyclic one like the one we'll we'll build up here. Um, my gosh, I I don't know why there's not a good picture of it. I'll draw it on the board. The board okay, good. Here we have SIR. We have flows in from S to I, from I to R, 
and we have a waiting flow Q. Um, so, so let's suppose we call this flow I uh, from S to I, suppose we call the flow from I to R, lowercase r for recovery, lowercase i is, is for infection, and suppose we call this flow from R to S waning, or W. Under what conditions will this be invalid? <laughs> will its differential equations be invalid? Anyone? Yes, not you. Good, all the flows are equal. Um, or if we focus pointwise on each stop, the, the sum of the inflows we equal the sum of the outflows. So here we would need for S to be in balance, we would need what to equal what? The inflows are what? W, and the outflows are what? I. So we would need <laughs> W to equal I, right? Um, so we would need I equals W for, for one thing. We would also need what? For for the stock capital I, we would need what? What would we would need there for the equivalent? I equals R, right? Lower lowercase R, lowercase I equals lowercase R. And then for uh, the stock capital R, what would we need? We would need W equals R, lowercase R, right? Those are the things we would need. Or, and, and if these were the case, I could say S dot equals what? The rate of change, if this is the case, the rate of change of S will be what? Will be, be well, will be a constant, but it'll be a very special constant. If, if the stock, if the inflows for the stock are equal to the outflows, the rate of change of the stock will be zero. It'll be flat. Remember, if S dot is, actually, if S dot is, were five, for example, and we have units of persons and, and time unit of day, then it'll be rising at 10 per day. So it's minus five, but it'll be falling at 10 per day. A value of zero mean it's in balance. So S equals zero. Uh, if I equals R, what is I dot? Zero. If W equals R, what is R dot? Zero. The rate of change of S is zero. Is what this S dot equals zero. Right? The rate of change. It's not going up. It's not going down. It's staying the same. It's in balance. It stays at a fixed value. And all of these have to be true for this whole system to be about. Okay. So when we have a system for this many stocks, we ask about when is it in balance? It's in balance if all the stocks are in balance. We didn't really have to deal with that when we had a first order delay because we only had one, one stock to deal with, right? But when we have a system with multiple stocks, we have to deal with all the stocks have to be in balance. If you get that, you can do well in your exam. Okay. On um, probably get like 10 points more, um, like a hunk of points at once, just from that one, like knowing these basic things. Okay. Okay. So let's go build up a simple model quickly. Okay. We have half an hour. And again, we need to move fast. So get your ready logics up. And, and let's build this up and we'll see if we can place it in balance, okay? So please, please give this a try. Okay, so I have my any logic up and I'm going to start a model. So here we are. Um, I'm gonna do new model and this will be called, yes, Wade. Yeah, uh, it's going to be, SIRS, maybe I'll call it first SIRS, um, well, SIR, first SIRS, version one. Okay. Um, 
and its model time unit will be days. Okay. And we're going to be actually building up some things here, which will be emblematic and contagion. First, SIRS v1. There we go. Okay. Now, um, what we're going to do is is build up a simple one, a simple model composed of susceptible, infected, recovered, and where there are, it, it's illustrated up here on the board, where there are, there's a possibility of waiving immunity. So. Um, we're going to go to the palette here and go to the system dynamics palette. We'll drag in a stock for susceptible. Okay. We'll drag in another stock for, and you notice I'm, I'm putting it sort of three, three of these underlying squares, uh, away in hopes that that'll be the size of a flow. For infectives, infective, and another one for here, recover. Now, one thing that will, I should also strike you a bit of meddling twisting of strategy on a issue here. When we build up stocks and flow diagrams, this grammar, this, this syntax and stocks and flow diagram, um, uh, is something we'll be um, staying within. And the specification of these models will be entirely declarative. We'll be specifying what we want and allow the system to uh, to take. Okay, I should have put it four, four, um, four squares away. Um, so uh, I'm going to move this over there and we'll, we'll artfully um, place this one four away. So we're going to put two flows between those. And then we're going to, uh, maybe we'll leave it like that and we'll come back to the other flow, okay? So uh, let's go put in some uh, initial information. So when we have stocks, what do we have to specify for a stock? Do we have to specify equation or what? Right? Hmm. In what population? Yeah, um, population of agents at what time? At the initial time. Because after the initial time, how is the value of the stock determined? By the flow. So we only can specify, we don't have the latitude, and only if the latitude specifies value of the initial time. After that, it is its evolution is dictated by the flows. If the inflows are greater than the outflows, its value will rise. If the outflows are greater than the inflow, the value will drop. It's entirely how it changes from that initial value is entirely given by the flows. But we could specify the value of the flow. So the initial value of the stock of susceptible will be 1E6. Okay, it'll be a million people. Um, well, maybe, maybe we'll make it 300,000 to represent our fair city of Saskatoon. 300,000, three and five zeros, okay? Okay, great. And we're going to start with one infective. Why am I starting with one instead of zero? Anyone? Yeah, it needs to spread from somebody, right? Good, Ali, that's exactly right. And recovered will be zero. Okay, great. Okay, so we have these three stocks. We specified their initial value. After that, it will evolve totally uh, as dictated by the flows. We have to attempt to the flows. Sanity test. Let's suppose I make this flow zero. And I keep this, in fact, it is already zero by default. I make this flow zero. If I were to run this model, what would happen? These two flows are zero. And I specify, you know, 300,000 people per successful, one per effective, and zero for covered. And I run this model, what would happen? Nothing would change. Will it be inbound? 
get to balance. The, the sum breaks and they start the inflows, the sum of the inflows equals the sum of the outflows. The sum of the inflows and the outflows, in fact, for all are zero, right? So it's kind of a boring sort of equilibrium, but it would be an equilibrium. Okay, you ready? Okay, so let's not let's not bother running then. Suppose I were to make this flow here, or call it infect new infections. I'm gonna call it new infections, make it all one word because we live within the dictate, the scripture, the hegemony. Okay. Um, and the post new infections were, well, we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna leave it as zero for the moment. And then we're gonna call this one uh, new recoveries. Okay, could just call it recoveries, but I'll call it new recovery. Okay, um, so that's that's good. We we give it eight to these things. That's great, but we want to do something more. So suppose we were to make new recoveries. This is so. Remember the time unit of this model was eight. And each of these dots is the number of persons. So what is what is the dimension or the unit associated with new recovery? What is that unit? Anyone? Yes, sorry. Person per day. What's the unit associated with new infection? Say. If you but let me say it again. And let me say it for you. If you have a stock of of dimension call the dimension of the stock a and you have some dimension of time call it t the dimension of time the dimension of all the flows into the stock has got to be of dimension a over time so if a is people and time is days that all the flows into and out of the stock have got to be people per day if Time were years, and we have people, the value of all the flows, in, or sorry, the dimension of all the flows in and out of the stock is going to be people per year. If the stock was a the stock of dollars, right, um, and we had time in months, we would have dollars per month as the inflow and outflow of uh, flows. Okay, important direction. If you remember that and reason about it, you can stop all sorts of problems. Okay, so suppose we were to take this and have new recoveries be one. What does one mean here? Anyone? Yes, or one, one probably means something. It's not probably about one person per day. So what would happen if we make this one? What would happen? One person per day will be recovered. And how would the number of people that are infected change? Yeah. It starts at one. And so what is it going to do it, it, by day one? What is it going to be? After one day, what will it be? It'll be zero and then it will go negative, right? So obviously that's not a good thing, right? It's non-physical. We can't have negative people. And in general, we have some balancing loop that's going to limit it. The number of recoveries has got to depend on the number of people who can't recover, right? So if a billion people can recover, we're going to have more recoveries than if you have nobody who's going to recover. So of course it has to make sense. Of course there has to be some limiting factor, some negative feedback associated with it. So if there are fewer infected, there will be fewer recoveries. Okay? Um, Let's put that in place. Let's have a put in place a mean, put in a, a formula, mean time until, or call it mean time infected. Okay. I, I put it in a parameter, dragged it in. Remember, parameters are assumptions and they communicate those assumptions. And its value, ladies and gentlemen, will be 10. What does 10 mean in this model? Day, one day. Okay. 
And we need to hitch it up to the thing that depends on it, which would be here, new recoveries, that flow. What else does new recoveries have to depend on? We just said, it, it needs to depend on the number of people who are infected. If there ain't nobody to, to recover, there should be nobody recovered. There's a billion people to recover, there'll be more people recovered. So it's got to depend, right? It's got to, like the number of new recoveries has to depend on any physical system on the clock. Okay, so this is a what? Guess what this is going to be? A begins with S. It has three words in it. That second word begins with O. The last word begins with D. The first word begins with M. The first word ends with C. The last word ends with S. It has a Y, it's the second class. First the word is delay. It's going to be a big get first word is delay, right? Um, okay. So, we have a mean time. Do you recognize this? Like, like <laughs> mean time, right? Maybe if I called it tau, it would have. Maybe it's your enemy. I don't know. Um. So, uh, but it's my friend. Okay. So, what's the formula going to be if this is the first order delay? What is, what's the formula going to be? Exactly what? Yes, I I we stand on the cusp of greatness, and and so how do I? Finish it. So infective. So it depends on if, if divide. Okay, good. Every exam, every exam, I get st students standing on the cusp of greatness, and they run away in the opposite direction by writing time. Do not write time here. This does not make sense dimensionally. That it would be time, right? This needs to be. People per day in the flow. If, if there were effective times, mean time effect, it would be like people days. The flow would be like people days, right? Um, um, and if that doesn't make sense, right? Um, that that somehow the flow is people days. It's got to be people per unit time. Okay, so that's that's good. Now, what would happen if we ran this? What what would happen now? Would this stock go negative? Be gone use? Would the stock go negative? No. No, it would go down. And what, what would the curve of it going down look like? Darn right. Have you seen that before? Like, like that, right? Um, e to the minus alpha t times, and what's the initial number of people in the stock? One. Yeah. So it started at one. And it's coming down in just this exponential way with what is alpha here? What is alpha? One over 10. Bingo. Not 10. One over 10. Right? Alpha equals one over tau. Tau is 10 days, right? Mean time. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are. Proceeding well, but we've got to keep up the pace. So we're going to add in a gimme. We're going to add in our first auxiliary variable. And it's going to be called total population. If you looked, I just gave you its formula too. So we're going to add in an auxiliary variable, which any logic calls in an unfortunate choice of names dynamic variable. Okay, um, we're going to call it total population. Good. And I'm going to situate it up here for with malice of forethought. Okay, so what is the formula for this going to be? Yes, is that the plus effective recovered? So what do we need to do? We need to draw the dependencies with it, or else any logic will be an unhappy camper, and other system dynamics packages will be equally unhappy. It's not any logic. It's you're trying to make your model transparent. Remember that a lot of the goals of system dynamics models are to change people's mental models. 
And there's a real emphasis on having them be visibly parsable, like having be able to understand. Ooh, okay. So somehow I, I uh, thought that last one. Have it be visually understandable. Have it be uh, transparent what the assumptions are as much as possible. So here we're going to have total population depend on these things. And this will be, as Matthias said, uh, susceptible, susceptible plus, uh oh, uh oh, plus infective, oops, come on, plus infective plus recovered, right? Oh my gosh, what am I doing? Okay, make sure it builds and is a happy camper. Okay. Okay, good. That's an instantaneous function of successful objectives and more Okay. Um, good. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to put in an additional component, which is going to be the fractional prevalence. And I'm going to drag in this too will be a auxiliary variable. So I'll say fractional prevalence. And I defined that earlier. Does anyone remember what it means? Yeah, it's the fraction of the population that are infected. So it's got a numerator and denominator, like fractions do, right? Fraction is the numerator over denominator. It's a quotient. So the denominator is the total population. And the numerator of it is what? What's in the numerator? Infected, right? Good. Good. So it's going to be infective divided by total population. Are you okay with that? Okay. Good. Um, you'll notice me if you saw for engineering one So now I'm going to put in the final bits of reasoning that are, you will see them in countless infectious disease models. And if you are interested in the models used during the pandemic, the following formulas are in thousands of those things. Literally, I'm not, I'm not exactly, probably tens of thousands by now. And then they go back over a century. going to be a construct which is going to be it's going to be just like alpha it's going to be a hazard a chance per unit time people will get infected okay chance per unit time someone will get infected and this is going to be called the force of infection okay force of infection we're going to put it right down here force of infection that is a term of art. It's widely talked about among people talk, uh, talking about infectious diseases, but it's a type of, of alpha. It's, it's just a chance for you in a time someone will get infected. And particularly the way it's going to, how do you think that will impact the model? If, if we have a chance for you in a time called force infection, the someone will get infected, where will it show up? What will depend on? If, if we have a chance for unit time, someone will get infected. Chance per day, someone will get infected. What? I'll give you a hint. What flow would you have on? Yeah. Okay. So let's put a formula, a link there. Okay. And guess up, guess what else new infections will depend on? 
susceptible. It's got to be dependent on susceptible because if there's nobody susceptible, no one will get infected. Do you agree with that? And what do you think the formula for this is going to be? I'll give you a hint. It's based on a term that has three words. The first word starts with M. The second word starts with O. The last word ends with S. It, it, guess what this is again? Yeah, it's a first order delay. It's your old enemy. Well, okay, Frank. Okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, here, here again, you, you've got it again. So what's the formula for this going to be? Remember, the force of protection is a chance per unit time, a probability per unit time, a hazard. It operates just like alpha. So what's the formula going to be? Susceptible times the force of infection. Or force of infection times susceptible. Yeah, we could, we could phrase it either way. Okay. So this is a first order delay, folks. Except now it's not a constant. It's just going to change. Comes to that. Normally, this is alpha is a constant. I said it operates like alpha. You can think of it at a given time as time here, just like alpha. But it's going to change all the time. And guess what force of infection will depend on? What other thing nearby it will it depend on? Speak use as 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 a Greek chorus. Yeah, well, it'll yes, it will depend on effective through what? Yeah, the fractional prevalence. So it's got to depend on fractional prevalence. If nobody in the population is infected, do you think any infections will occur? Do you think anyone will get infected if there's no one out there that's infected? No. It takes two to tango. There needs to be infected for someone to get infected. And there also needs to be what? Again, for that. Susceptible. This is like nonlinear. It doesn't depend just on one or just on the other. It depends on the combination. Having both. You have to have both in order for someone to get infected. Okay. Um, and we'll see that nonlinearity come up perhaps before the end of this very session, if we move quickly, okay? Okay, so force of infection, it's gonna depend on force of infection. But, um, this, oh, sorry, force of infection is gonna depend on fractional prevalence to me, but we're gonna need two other pieces to complete the reasoning, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to add in a parameter that's going to be called contacts, per person, per day, okay? So it's number of persons per person per day that people need. Um, for each person, they need a certain number of persons per day. Um, and we're gonna give it a value of 10. It's actually units are gonna be one over days, sort of how frequently they meet, they meet people. Um, the 10 will mean they need on average 10 people. Each person needs 10 people per day. Person per person per day. So the time is the dimension will be one over day. Okay, so how many people do you need per day? Yeah. Okay. Um, and next, so that's one of the, um, I'm sorry, make that 15. I said 10, but make it, I'm sorry, make it 20, make it 20. It'll just be easier for my explanation in a moment. 20. Okay, next, we're going to add in a parameter that's going to be called probability of transmission. And I'm going to say per discordant contact, okay? Um, uh, I'm I'm trying to keep it a bit shorter than it might otherwise be, but be explanatory. What this is, this is a probability. If if a susceptible meets an, an infected meets a susceptible, what's the chance for contact with them that they will transmit the infection? Okay, um, and that value is going to be here, um, point one. Okay, 
0 0.1. There we go. 0 0.1. Okay. Awesome. Um, and now we can finish this job. Okay. Um, we can go take take uh, links from the probability of transmission per discordant contact to the force of infection and uh, a link from contacts per day to force of infection. Now we're gonna put it all together into one formula. And I'm gonna tell you what this formula is and I want you to, to watch it. Remember the force of infection is it's kind of like serving it like alpha. It's a chance per day that a susceptible will get infected. Mark my words, did you hear that? The force of infection is the chance per day of susceptible to get infected. Right? Um, just like alpha is a chance per day you'll leave here. Okay. Okay. So the force, the, the formula for it will be contacts per. Remember that autocomplete is your friend too. So you can do control space or on on Mac. We can say instead of voice, what do I Option space. And that's true. So, um, option space, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we'll, we'll fill it out. So imagine people have contact with 20 people per day. Now imagine that 50% of them say were infected. Imagine 50% of the whole population were infected, were infected. On average, how many infected people were there per day? Think of this is only 20 people total. And imagine the population is half infected. How many people are they going to meet on average per day who are infected? 10. 20. That's the total people they're going to meet per day times the 50%, right? Of, of them that are likely to be infected. Hmm? So it's going to be contacts per person per day times, guess what? Where can we find the fraction of the population that's infected? Fractional prevalence. There we go. And now for each, and so that's the number of people they meet per day. Contacts per day times fractional prevalence is the number of people they meet per day who are infected. We're going to say each of those people they meet per day that are infected has a certain probability of transmitting infection to them. And where is that probability of transmitting infection? We already created a, a parameter for it, this probability of transmission per discordant contact. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the key formula that drives infectious disease models worldwide. And Certainly, there are tens of thousands, at least, of models in print, public and peer reviewed literature that use that, that form. Okay. So, that, so we have, they have, uh, say, 20 contacts per day with anyone. Of them, this number of contacts times fractional prevalence, so the number of contacts per day they have with infectious people, and each of those people those infectious people confers this probability. Ladies and gentlemen, you should be able to build your model and you should be able to run your model, no less. And if you do so, you will see the number of people that are infective rise in simulation of an outbreak. And now you will see it decline. During this period, it was spreading. There's a positive feedback loop among new infections leading to more infectives, leading to higher fractional prevalence, leading to higher fraction, higher force of infection. In other words, high risk susceptibles will get infected. And this positive feedback initially, it rises until the number of susceptibles can't sustain it. And then it starts dropping down and it's limited by the number of recoveries. And it's dropping down towards towards zero. Okay, so that's our first little model there. Uh, we're out of time. I'm sorry. Yes, I can post the model. I'll I'll do that right right now. Okay.
I think I'll ask you to add in a waning of immunity component. We've just seen how it spread that rise to a peak in the first outbreak and along the fine and the question will be how does that change when people can lose immunity? And that's what a lot of students do. Okay. Um, and uh, we'll talk about it next time. And this will dovetail immediately with what you see in that next video. Be sure to watch that video that may have eluded you on two types of uh, two types of uh, these first order delays. Okay, and I will post the video post haste. Yes, um, give me just one second, Nona. Why don't you put that down? Uh, or I could put it down over there. I'll. I'll... Uh, that's fine. Yeah, it depends how many people are uh, um, are here needing to show me things. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Take care there. I'm